What was once a cornfield now sets a sprawling campus known as Redemption Christian Church. In small town rural southern Indiana, 23 years ago, an upstart church began with a handful of people, and God has grown it to an impactful church of more than 2,000 with campuses in three towns. How did this happen? What did God use to not just make a church grow, but create a movement of Christ followers who are brought into the mission of loving God, loving people, and changing the world? This is the Redemption Story, a series of programs in association with Redemption Christian Church and the Kevin R. Smith Company that attempts to tell a bit of the story of what God has done and is doing at and through Redemption Christian Church. Well, Daryl, we're again. blessed again yep. to have Daniel Ross. What, what's your title, by the way? I, I've heard a number of, of versions of it, and it sounds like it wraps around a business card a few times. <laughs> yeah. but. Uh, my official title is executive minister. Oh, okay. It's not that bad, right? No. It's, it's pretty good in that piece. But listen, thank you so much for what you shared with us uh, uh, last week. And again, what a great job you and the entire group of the musical uh, worship team here at Redemption does. And I'm not sure if that's the right title, so pardon me if I'm not getting it getting it nailed. But you know, we talked about how you and Daryl got connected, how you and the church and your family in the church. And, and one of the things that I'm just curious about, and we kind of ended last week's episode, it doesn't all come together smoothly, and I'm sure that was true back when you were first starting. Talking about challenges, the musical worship group, and you have today in that regard versus what it was like 24 years ago. Yeah, I think challenges, there's always a challenge when it comes to music because music is very subjective. Mm -hmm. What I like and what you like are probably way vastly different from one another. Now you multiply that by uh, 2,500 people. And so you're, you're always going to have an opinion about what you want to hear in terms of music worship. Uh, so I think that's, that's a challenge that will never end. Um, I would say in the beginning, one of the challenges that we had was that we were trying to do something different in a, in a community uh, that had never had anything mm -hmm. like that done. Um, was it common to have, have the no, music we have today no, when you started? No, not at all. In fact, I think we were the only ones okay. that were doing that kind Absolutely, of thing. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I think with that came that anytime you have people that weren't new to church, but maybe they came over to, to CCJ at the time, um, and they had come from a different church background, they had an understanding of what music worship was supposed to be. Mm. And it did not include the things that we were doing, right? It didn't include, the th my background didn't include that. Mm. My grandfather told me, when I told him I wanted to play guitar, he was a fundamentalist Baptist preacher, and he said, I wish you'd learn to play piano instead because you can use piano in church, you can't use guitar in church. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, I'm, I love my grandfather, and I loved him, and may he rest in peace, but I, he was wrong about that, you know. And so you, ha you have those kinds of things uh, that you have ideas about what it should sound like and what it should be, and, and so that's always going to be a challenge. I don't think we get that quite as much anymore just because we're so much larger mm -hmm. and individual voices are sometimes harder to hear uh, when, you're, when you're as large as we are. But when you're 30, 40, 50 people, a single voice that says, you know, I wish you'd do something different really, yeah. you know, pierces for a guy like me at least, uh, really kind of hit me harder, you know, back then. Uh, I would say challenges uh, that are ongoing include just personalities, the personalities that usually are drawn to being on stage mm. are sometimes bigger. Um, I don't think, I, I can honestly say that we're, <laughs> I better be careful about saying this, <laughs> but I think we're probably at the most peaceful time of personalities as, as far as volunteers go, uh, goes, but we've definitely had that over the years as well. And, you know, just, well, I want to do this and I want to do that. And, you know, you have to be a leader and you have to say, this is what we're going to do. And while taking their opinions into consideration at the same time. We want to get into to, to the preparation involved and the planning for a Sunday worship. But before we get away from just the initial vision piece, the music and the approach that Daniel team brought when the church first came into existence wasn't commonplace. Where did that vision come from, that hope that you had to expand and have a wider musical worship maybe than what tradition had up to that point in time? Yeah, you know, by that time that I came to start Redemption, I had been, of course, in Bible college where you have real diverse. I mean, one weekend 
one Tuesday in chapel, you might have a piped organ. Mm -hmm. Then next fr Friday, because we had chapel twice a week, you might have a full band uh, kind of rocking it out. Uh, then you might have uh, a banjo and a fiddle player. I mean, it was just very diverse at my college. You know, the college kind of attracts a little bit more of that, the young people. And then, you know, I had been a student, a youth minister for so long. You go to CIY conferences and you have a lot of different. So I, I just knew I'd been to North American Christian Convention, all those things. I'd visited a lot, uh, some of the what we would have called mega churches back then, Southeast Christian Church of Louisville, and saw plenty of, like, we didn't invent the wheel here at all. We just brought the wheel to a place that had never been used before, <laughs> kind of, so to speak. And so, really, that, that's really where it, my inspiration came from, seeing that done in a lot of the uh, megachurch world, um, so to speak, and youth conference world, and to just thinking, you know what, there is a, a way to reach unchurched or dechurched people this way, because they're not coming for this, so they'll come for this, possibly, and check it out. And so that was really the inspiration. I, like, I knew what we wanted to do. I just don't, I don't have a lot of musical giftedness. I played drums, but I never was good at it and uh, stuff. But uh, so... I knew what we needed to do, just didn't have the ability so to bring people in that had those abilities. And there were some ladies that Daniel talked about, the four ladies leading. They really were crucial in helping us pick songs and, and lead up front. And, and even some of them were part of the early versions of the band um, and, and even throughout. Um, so anyway, that's kind of that was the inspiration. I just really thought if you're going to reach people who are not being reached, you've got to do things that are not being done. And that was one of the ways I knew would just knew in my heart of hearts would make a difference. Thank you for that. And thank you for, for that vision and bringing that in that piece. You mentioned a moment ago, Daniel, uh, before we talk about the actual musical team and the preparation, but you talked a bit about, I think I heard you say what's embedded. There's got to be a strong confidence level to step on the stage in that piece. And before we started recording the episode uh, today, I stepped out on the stage just to just to see what you all see on a Sunday. What, 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 you can look directly in the eye, just about everybody yeah. that's here. I didn't realize that view. I never looked at it in that, in that aspect before. But when we're in the congregation and watching everyone on stage, you just feel like they're exactly where they were meant to be. That, that self-awareness, that heart, they know they're, they're meant to be there. Talk a little bit about that experience. And is it always there the first time? Yeah, no, I mean, it's not there the first time. Um, I would say, I, like, personally, I have the benefit, and I think Daryl's probably the same way, you know, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years for him, um, and you do you do grow comf comfortable with it, or at least less nervous uh, about being. I remember the first Sunday we were in Worship Center A, the Worship Center here in Jasper. Uh, we had been in the multipurpose room for like seven years prior to that. And prior to that, we had been in a warehouse. Um, I remember the first time we were on stage in this room, I, I even said to the congregation, I'm really nervous today. And I've been doing this at that point for, you know, a dozen years. Um, but I think you, you have to, one of the things that, that helps is just to remember why you're up there. And it's not to give a concert, you know, you're not, um, you're not performing, quote unquote, uh, for the people. You're leading them, uh, and so if you can keep that in the forefront of your mind, that helps a lot when you're when you're looking out at the congregation. And you know, sometimes you look out at the congregation. If if you know what's going on in some of the people's lives, you can see like how this song mm. is is hitting them, or the song is not hitting them, or they're taking a drink of coffee while we're singing this really powerful line about you know, God's redemption of us, you know. So you do, you do look up where I said it. Oh, yeah, that's thing. right. <laughs> you know, and you can see the kid running around, and you can see, you know, somebody with their eyes closed uh, who, and who's raising their hands. And uh, I just remember a few Easter's ago, uh, we were singing these songs about resurrection. Uh, and I looked out in the congregation, and there sat a family who's, uh, the the husband of the wife uh, had died, and of course that was the dad mm. to these two kids that were these kids were about my kids' age, uh, and I remember looking at them while we were leading those songs, and it was like that these words that we're singing that we're leading them to sing, um, they mean something extra mm. for that family today at least, you know, and that, that's. 
you know, I don't know all the lives of, you know, the, the hundreds of people that sit out there every day, but um, they come in, they all come in with something, right? Uh, and so when you're, when you're leading them, you, got, you have to remember that it's not about you. Uh, it's not about whether or not I, you know, play this ripping guitar solo just right or if I hit all the notes just right. Now, you want to do all those things. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be a distraction when you're, when you're leading, but you're, you're trying to help those people connect uh, with, with the Lord, you know, so. And that's a growth process. There was a, a time earlier in Daniel's life of doing it where if a guitar string would break in the middle of it, <laughs> it'd be like, oh, you know, the sky's falling oh, kind of moment. He wouldn't necessarily show it on stage, but I know he wanted well to know it, where now it's just like, so that happened. Yeah. We're still leading people to God and, you know, we'll, and so it's, it, you, start, you grow a little more in that when you first start it. Uh, and all of our venues are a little different because if you're in Tell City, I mean, you're like standing four feet away from <laughs> the front row, you know. And so when Ryan Litton's leading there, of course, it's just a total different, different thing. Uh, uh, and and in, at Logoti, such as where the lights are, I can't hardly see the audience out there when I'm up on stage. There, it's just so each one's just a little bit different. But you, you do have to just. You, I think you do grow comfortable enough in and say, this is why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about whether. Uh, plus, I've just learned down through the years, and I think this could be said musically as well, a sermon like your, your consistency is more important than your, gr mm -hmm. your greatest moments. So, uh, so if you, you know, if you can, I, I played top golf recently, and I won a couple of the competitions because I just kept consistently hitting to the mid-range one. You know, and I, I, it made me think, you know, Bob Russell, a mentor of mine, used to say, it's better to hit a lot of doubles than try to hit a home run every week. And so just consistently working to, to make sure you're putting a quality, um, quality effort out there to glorify God and to engage the people. So. I found top golf can improve my game quite a bit. I'm not worried about where the pin or the flag That's is right. at so That's much right. of the score in that piece. But... And I know Daryl will, will recognize this name, but it, following athletics my whole life, very much no talent here, but very much impacted by the mentors I have from a young age up. But I really come to appreciate the, the band director at Springs Valley, John Ellsworth, mm -hmm. and the manner of which he put in the work, the mind share to accomplish excellence at a level that at that age I had no idea what was taking place. Mm -hmm. But probably I have more respect, no, not probably, without a doubt, him and musical artists with all you all and anyone involved in that person have to do in preparation. It's not as simple as standing in front of a microphone on that Sunday or that Saturday night, whenever that may be. Talk a little bit for Daniel Ross. What do you focus, what does Daniel do as far as, you know, the? I don't mean performances in show, but as far as skill set, keeping it where you want it to be, what's that take? Yeah, so I mean, I'm... 46 by the time this comes out I may be 47 we'll see uh, but I don't know if that's a dig on you uh, no, 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 or, my or, the, or the guy my, cameraman my, my birthday soon so well happy birthday uh, thanks. Yeah. we should have had a birthday cake yeah, right. <laughs> but I know for me um, I practice every Saturday afternoon at home I play the songs I, you know, my wife usually goes and takes her shower while I'm doing that so that she's not, you know, hearing me uh, crank up my amp in, in the spare bedroom. Uh, but I do that every week. Um, you know, I, I try to, as much as I can, uh, stay up on, you know, what new songs we need to, to be considering. Uh, that, helps, that helps tremendously now that we have a team. Mm -hmm. uh, around this and it's not just all on one person's shoulders um, but try to stay up uh, on top of that um, take care of your voice you know all those kinds of physical things I think the the more important uh, aspect um, without trying to sound too holier than thou or anything like that is like when I got into the consistency of reading my bible every day mm -hmm. uh, that's helped because some days you know I think this morning I probably read and didn't get a whole lot out of it, but then some days I do. Mm. But I think it's the consistency day in and day out, day in and day out, that's, that's important. Uh, and so deepening my relationship with Jesus is the more important thing than as far as leading goes. Now, all the physical things, Father Time is undefeated, as they said. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, you can feel it. You know, I'm tired, more tired when I leave the stage than I used to be. I should probably get back into the gym. I've heard that a few times. Uh, but, uh, you know, just practicing. I love to play guitar. I think when we had the stay-at-home stuff with COVID, I probably took my guitar playing to a, a, a next level, I felt like because things clicked, and that was 20 years into playing, you know. So you're always learning something new. You can always learn a new skill set. You know, just keep challenging yourself. And a lot of, a lot of people, sorry, may not be aware, but, you know, our, our, our campuses, the people who are leading on Sunday morning are here on Tuesday night for a couple hours uh, <clears throat> learning what they're going to do and then kind of running through it. And then generally speaking, they, they come and do some run-throughs of some of the, especially trouble spots, probably on Sunday mornings as well. So yeah. there's, there is a ton of time and effort goes into it. Yeah, talk a little bit about the team and how the band itself, uh, many times there's more than one individual on that stage. How do they get ready for that Sunday worship? Yeah, I mean, going back, um, you know, continuing the history part of it a little bit, when we, when we started, we quickly formed kind of a core group of people. Uh, Jeff Kirby played for a while, and then Jeff realized he needed to hand that off to somebody else, so he called up Mike Weisensteiner and said, you need to come do this, and Mike didn't really have a choice, so he came and did it, and uh, Mike and I became pretty close uh, after that, and he served, he's still serving, so he's 20 plus years into it, and for a long time, we had a, a band, not multiple bands, mm -hmm. and they played every single week, and we used to give Mike a hard time. One summer, we, we said, oh, you're taking this big vacation because he took two Sundays off. <laughs> you know, so he played 50 Sundays that year. Oh, wow. And we gave him a hard time about the summer of Mike. You all know? heart, right? Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, because we all played every week. Um, and then when we started growing um, and getting multiple bands and, and things like that, uh, it... It, it changed how we had to lead and how we had to get ready and stuff like that. So no longer did we have multiple weeks to get ready for a new song. We had the Tuesday before mm. to get ready for the new song. In fact, uh, as we're recording this, Easter Sunday is coming up, uh, and we're going to do a, a kind of a special song uh, that we've never played together before. We're going to have to figure it out at practice, you know, and uh, so... You, you really have to impress on the volunteers that, um, you know, you, you need to be ready on your own. You know, I, we, can't, we can't come in on Tuesday night not, not having listened to the song, not having um, prepared in, in the least bit. Like, uh, I walked down to Kurt Neighbor's office, uh, who's our technical director, and he's playing guitar this week, and he was in there yesterday playing, you know, practicing some of the songs on his own. Uh, and you have to do that kind of stuff, and you have to challenge the people, and you have to set expectations mm. uh, for the volunteers. And so there is a level of expectation uh, that has to be met. And I think people, a lot of times, when we have, when we tell them about we have auditions, things like that, they think, oh, you know, you just is this American Idol or something? But it's not <laughs> about that. It's more about can you do what's required mm. to to be to do this on a regular basis. Ever been a moment or time to where you've had this plan and you've got this slate of songs and then last minute before Sunday hits, you've got to make a change? Yeah, I mean, we've done that a handful of times. I think one that jumps out um, to me, uh, 20, 2012 or so, um, uh, a lady that was, uh, you know, a lot of people knew in the church passed away from uh, heart failure, I think, and... Um, we had had, it was right before Christmas, and we had to kind of um, adjust what we were going to do because you just have to be able to read the room a little bit too, you know. Uh, we've had some, some tougher Sundays where you just have to say, okay, we're not going to do big celebratory anthemic mm -hmm. songs that uh, we're going we're gonna to dial it back a little bit just to kind of, you have to realize what the, the mood of your, of your people are. Uh, so we've we've done that kind of thing before. Yeah, yeah you've heard Daryl by watching the other podcast talk a lot about the culture piece. So what you just described really resembles the culture of the church that many of us see, both mm -hmm. probably in the leadership piece as well as the congregation or the community as a whole. Talk a little bit about what you've seen as the culture has developed these twenty four years. Yeah, I think some of those things have been in place from day one. You know, um, Daryl has done a really great job of like 
casting that vision uh, and saying, you know, we're here to, to win the loss to Christ. Uh, we're here to do whatever it takes to lead people to Jesus, short of sin. Um, and so I think that's, that's been the same uh, over, the, over the period, over the history of the church. Um, the culture of the church, we, we've always had this uh, idea of we want to do things with excellence, not for excellence sake, uh, but for the glory of God, because we want to give our best uh, to God. Uh, so that's always been in place. I think those kinds of things have always just uh, evolved over the years as well. So. You've used the word consistency. Daryl's used the word yeah. consistency. And you've talked a lot about uh, the musical piece, and we've referenced the musical piece and the strength that Daniel and the team brings. His role as executive minister, I'm sure there's some other aspects that he plays critical part in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, communications has always been a part of them. We've, in recent times, uh, kind of shifted to where we have a team of people that <laughs> do what Daniel uh, has done a lot himself. And, and um, uh, but yeah, the, that's a big part of it. But part of it. But the executive minister, you know, I had never been in a church large enough to have an executive minister. Yeah, me either. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the largest church I was ever in before redemption was about 200 people, and uh, we didn't have an executive minister. And uh, so, what an executive minister role really is is, is they help manage and run the staff and the administrative side of the of both pastoral and honestly business side of the church. Because if you're the, a lead minister, you often, A, don't have some of those gifts, um, and B, don't have the time if you're going to be a pastor to people mm. uh, to, to take and run with those things. So it's kind of like uh, finding people and delegating. And Daniel was always very good at, at organization and list, and he would probably consider himself a little bit OCD on, on following this sort of things. Not and get, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you need someone like that, but yet somebody that can still relate with people, um, which he does really well. You know, he can talk about the baseball game, he can talk about music, all those kind of things too. But uh, so he, it just seemed like when we were looking to, when we were growing and, and adding campuses in particular, we felt it was really important to have an executive minister. And most of the churches I know that are over a thousand in particular have a have an executive minister and he and he seemed like the natural fit for that um, unfortunately he had to do two jobs two and a half jobs for a long time because uh, he's he and he still oversees the worship team but he had to do do that but it was just really important for me to put him in that role so I could then focus on because I started noticing part of what get got us to where it was was I like to be out with people. Mm -hmm. I like to go to hospital calls. I like to, to be involved in schools and extracurriculars and, and coach basketball. I like to do all those things, but if, if, I, if I don't have somebody taking care of the day-to-day, -day, I can't do those mm -hmm. things. So I'm getting away from what I think is one of my strengths, which is you know, being out with people and re relational in that way. And so it was really crucial to have that, and he was a natural fit for that, and it's just been awesome. I mean, the staff really looked to him. Um, you know, uh, it's no secret we we've went through a time of testing and crisis uh, recently, and Daniel was at the forefront of leading our staff through that and 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 leading our communications people through that, and and so that's just an important piece. So, I bet you you never thought you were going to be an executive minister. <laughs> when you were Not a clue. In college. Uh, Not a clue. So, talk a little bit maybe about what that experience has been like for you. Yeah, I mean, like when you and I think Drew Thurman said to me, uh, we sat down in the shell of what is the Ligoti campus now, and you guys sat and talked to me about being the executive minister. I think it was called executive minister of operations at the time. Yeah. And you started telling me what that was. I was like, uh, that, I don't think so. You know, that's not, <laughs> not, what, not real sure I want to do that. Uh, but I knew that I had the gifts that you, you guys were describing, uh, and I knew that I could do it. And it seemed like a an opportunity, a challenge for me that uh, I might not have taken mm -hmm. had you guys not pushed a little bit on that. But, um, yeah, it's been rewarding, I think, for me uh, in that I get to use some of those things that I didn't necessarily know that I had mm. uh, that God has really developed uh, through the opportunity to do this. Yeah, and it's really cool. We've talked all throughout this podcast about God sending the right people, right time. 
uh, one of the gentlemen that was chairman of our elders was in one of the the, the bands. Uh, he, he moved on because he was in executive leadership with uh, corporations here, and then he got promotions and went other places. And he was always really close with Daniel. And so I would just imagine that he's been kind of a guy that Daniel can go to because he's really gifted in executive leadership and say, hey, help, yeah. me, help me work through this issue. And this yeah. Bob Foote was his name, just great guy. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I mean, when when you guys talked to me about executive ministry, I I called Bob and I said, "Hey, tell me what an executive does," <laughs> you know, because like no idea. I mean, I went to school, I had a mass communications degree, uh, worked in a newspaper, I was an editor and designer, and then I was a worship minister and did communications and stuff like that. And you know, honestly, you know, the when I thought of executives. I thought of people I didn't like very much, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, it's nothing just, wrong with nothing that. Nothing wrong with that. You know, now I'm in that spot. So people, people are looking at me and think, I don't like that guy very much, but, um, no, I, it just was not something I had ever considered, you know? Um, and it's one of those things where God puts you where he wants you to be, I think. So, yeah, Absolutely. Well, you you have brought so much to the congregation, the church, and and you've talked. We've talked a lot about vision and culture peace. And Daniel, what would you challenge the church community with today, as far as that love of Christ, uh, uh, giving back, helping spread that peace? What can we do to help take what you all do so well for us daily, weekly, and go forward? Yeah, um, I had lunch uh, a while back with uh, one of my former bosses at the Herald. And um, he, he said, you know, what, it, what is it about redemption? Why, why has all this happened? And, you know, I really, without going, you know, into all the weeds about it, I, I just said, I think we really believe what we're saying. Mm. Uh, and so I, I think as far as challenging the congregation, I, I think it would be to... Uh, you know, religion's kind of a silly hobby if that's all it is for you, right? Mm. Uh, if you don't believe it, you know, what are you doing? Uh, so that's that's always been my my challenge to people is like, do you believe this? Because if you do, then it changes your life, and it changes the lives of, of people around you. And I'm not the most outgoing guy in the world, so uh, you know, whenever we do sermon series about uh, talking to your neighbors and stuff like that, I'm always like, oh man, I don't know if I can do that or not. <laughs> Uh, but I think just in your day in, day out life, um, if Jesus really did, really lived, really died, really rose, then that, that's going to make an impact on your life. So I would challenge the people with that. Uh, and I think the big thing right now that has been on my mind a lot uh, is passing this on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we're seeing now, like, like I said, my daughter just turned 21. My other daughter's 19. They were both in the early class of kids that were born into this church. Uh, you know, some of those, I mean, we started in 2000. They were born in 2003, 2005. So they're that early group of, of kids, uh, and they're entering adulthood now. Uh, and we've had uh, what we call Timothys come from our mm. student ministry who are now in ministry uh, and thriving, and it's really, really cool to see. So I guess my challenge would be to keep that going. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, as I said before, I always hear on uh, the sports show PTI, I always hear them say, Father Time is undefeated. And I know I said that before, but it's true. I mean, we're not going to be here forever. Can't, just this past week we said, uh, we read that passage in Psalms that says, teach us to number our days. Mm. Um, and I love the book of Ecclesiastes, which talks about the same thing. Uh, and so we're not going to be here forever, and this needs to keep going. As long as Jesus hasn't returned, we want this church to keep going because we've got a mission that doesn't end when, when Daryl and I are in the ground. You know, uh, it, it has to keep going. So that's, that's my challenge. Well, thank you for those words, and thank you for joining us in these two episodes. God bless you, my friend, for all you do. Yep. We love you, and we appreciate you. What a talent you are in that piece. And we were glad you were outgoing enough to talk to us during the <laughs> podcast. Daryl and I would have been sitting here staring yeah, back and odd. forth on yeah. this music thing. Oh, he does yeah. a pretty good job. He was in the balcony the other day. I heard him sing. He does a really yeah. good job. He my to, wife makes me he keep used my to voice sing, low. He used to sing specials on the, at the Kathy Lane yeah. days. So. Yeah, true. you need to bring that back, right? <laughs> Throwbacks. Right. He sings in sermons sometimes. LG's 
sang this. Yeah, that's the first time so. LG's done that. That was pretty oh, I good. I love that. I love that. Daryl, God bless you. Appreciate Thanks. the opportunity to be here with you too. Yep. Look forward to seeing you next time.